Hey, what's up, y'all? In this video, I'm going to cover the Bubble T architecture. Bubble T is a library for building text user interfaces, aka TUIs, for the terminal, released by a company named Charm, who's also released a lot of really awesome libraries in Go for various things like terminal components, terminal styling and markdown rendering, backend tools like auth and key value stores, SSH servers, etc. Highly recommend checking them out over at charm.sh because they're really doing a lot of like mind blowing things that I don't see anyone else really doing. And I really believe in their long term vision. So I want to start off by going over some high level architecture for bubble tea, go over some terminology, and then we're going to start to piece all this together by coding up an app after this. I think it's really important to map this out visually before we jump into the code, because it's going to give us a better direction on how we can approach building our app. So Bubble T was largely inspired from the Elm architecture. If you've had any experience on the web with Elm or Redux or even with Swift's composable architecture, a lot of this is going to feel familiar and natural to you. If not, no worries. That's what we're here to cover because this can definitely be an intimidating paradigm at first and it really requires a different way of thinking. Not necessarily harder or easier, it's just different. Before we jump into like the hardcore architecture stuff, let's talk about how we'd initialize an app starting in our main.go file. So let's start at the top left and work our way through the diagram. When you create a new Bubble T app, the first thing you're going to do is call new program in your main function. You can optionally pass new program in initial model, which is essentially the initial state of your app expressed as a struct with any number of fields. Additionally, you can pass in a variadic amount of program options to the new program function to initialize your app with. For example, if you want your app to use the alt screen, you can pass that in as a program option and your app will trigger a separate display buffer from the main screen. This will essentially let you operate in full screen mode and you'll be able to take over the entire terminal UI. So once you've initialized your new program, then it's time to run it, which we'd also do in our main function. Once we run our program, we initialize our model along with our initial view and the bubble T event loop kicks off. So before we jump into the event loop, I want to flag a few terms here that you're going to want to mentally take note of. They are commands, messages, and MVU model view update. So those are kind of the magic words. If you retain anything from this video, let it be those five terms. When the init method is called after run, we can optionally return an initial command. So what does that mean? What is a command? In the Elm architecture, commands are functions that perform side effects with the outside world and return from the outside world a result in the form of a message. Now, in this context, we can think of the outside world as anything that can happen outside of our program's own memory space, like network requests, I.O. operations, talking to a database, etc. If you're familiar with Redux and you can kind of think of commands as analogous to sagas, thunks, or anything similar to how you'd communicate with the outside world. In the composable architecture, commands are analogous to an effect value. In Bubble T, commands are spun up as their own Go routine. So under the hood, Bubble T will automatically create a separate channel for each command, and it'll essentially be waiting on the Go routine to send a value back from the outside world, which that result value will then get routed back into the bubble T event loop as a message. So now let's talk about what a message is. A message is data of any type that is defined by us, the developer. So we can dispatch messages as ints, bools, strings, etc. Messages are commonly sent from the view to the update function, but can also be sent from a command to the update function. Messages basically let us know that some sort of event has happened within our app and we're just passing some info along that we're going to let our update function handle. Why would we want to use a message? Why introduce something extra instead of just having something like two-way data binding? Well, one of the big value propositions for using messages is it allows us to decouple the handling of our UI interactions in the view or decouple the handling of any communication with the outside world with commands from the updating of our model. Since the only way to update the model is through the update function, and the only way to trigger an update to the model is by sending a message, it makes it easier to reason about how the app state has changed and will change over time. 
So you might have even heard the buzzwords unidirectional data flow, and that's really what we're looking at here. So in order to trigger updates to our app, there are specific steps within the Bubble Tea architecture we should follow. Also, since messages are defined by us, the developer, it's easy to reason about what triggered it being sent and how that change should be represented over time. Okay, so let's just keep following the flow of data here. Now that our command has dispatched the message, this message will then be sent to the update function. Our update function is essentially parsing through all the messages that are being sent in our app and handling them accordingly inside of a switch statement. So if you're familiar with a reducer and redux or the composable architecture, this is very similar. So let's think about a real world example here. If we wanted to communicate with the GitHub API, we would want to send a command to make an HTTP request. And then we could return a status code message of type int, which mapped to all the various status codes. And it would be the update functions job to parse through those different status codes and react to them accordingly. Now, one thing that's important to note is that the update function returns two things. It returns a new model and it returns any number of commands. So if we wanted to display to the user the status code of our HTTP request, we would want to have a status code field on the model and assign the message to it in our update function. This would then automatically trigger a re-render to our view, which is just a string that represents what our UI should look like based on the current state of our model. Now this string can be composed of many other strings concatenated together in a little different way than you'd compose, say, the UI in a component-based web or mobile architecture, but the idea is relatively, and you know, I say this kind of hand wavy, but it's relatively the same. So now that we have our view, any events that happen in the view, say a key press, will dispatch a message, which will be handled by the update, which returns a new model, which triggers a re-renderer of the view, which starts the data flow all over again, rinse, repeat. So you can see how the data flow is unidirectional and even considering side effects, data is always gonna go in one predictable way. One other thing to note is that aside from the model struct, there is a model interface and to satisfy the interface, there's three functions necessary. They are the init, update, and view functions. So that was just a rough high level overview and that was definitely a lot of me talking. So I think now is a good time to jump into some code.